Before we get into the lesson of the day, I need to speak to those who will be watching this sermon on DVD later on or um, online in various churches and individuals. Uh, and I want you to know that what you see on the stage is because VBS starts tonight at 7 o'clock. And so for you, obviously, I, I, I'm hoping that you are prayerful about it that you, if you are participating as a student or as a teacher or helper, that you will uh, know that we appreciate all the hard work that you have done and will do this week. And I also want to just to acknowledge that as I preach on the ground today so I don't mess up the stage, that the cameras that are focusing, focusing right here on my nose, there are two monkeys right here <laughs> on my shoulders. Pat him on the head. <laughs> Charles, what were you thinking, man? <laughs> oh, it's right, it's Marilyn's fault. Okay, last week in our salvation series for our salvation summer, we looked at the truth that God did not send Jesus to this world to condemn us. He sent him to the world to save us. And as Phil read, uh, Jesus did have some things to say. He said that, that if there is any condemnation, it will be whether you ex by whether you accept or reject the words of Jesus Christ. If we accept His words, therefore obey them, live them, take them to heart, put them into action, uh, we, will, we will move beyond uh, condemnation to, to justification. I mean, obeying the word of God. But if we reject the words of Jesus, then there's nothing left for us, folks. Because by those words, words given, given to Jesus by God himself, were meant uh, to save our souls. But with that being said, I want you to, uh, to know that as you look at your Bible and just uh, con contemplate the Bible in your hand uh, in whatever form uh, you have, paper, leather, uh, uh, electronic, whatever, uh, I want you to know that uh, all of God's Word is inspired, all of the Bible. All of it relates to us, all of it, from Genesis to the, uh, to the end of Revelation, all of it is for our benefit all of it speaks of salvation for souls from the beginning and to the end. All of the Bible is the revelation of God our Creator and God our Savior. But there are some things that in addition to the Bible are simply put there uh, for our benefit as readers, not biblical in a sense, not, not uh, inspired in that way. I'm so grateful that years ago that the Bible was broken down uh, into books and chapters and verses. Of course, the various writings would have been designated of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, all the way through the 66 books. Um, that has always been true. But the Bible was, was presented to us so that we can not just find things, but so that we can understand the Bible uh, much better than we might um, have otherwise. One of the things that was added uh, in, the, in the recent past, or that it's not so recent past now, was the use of red letters uh, in the Bible that designates the words of Christ. Because I, I can understand those who perhaps haven't read the Bible very often would, would uh, miss the significance of, of the words that came out of the mouth of the Son of God. And so they would put Jesus' words in red. My, my Bible here is a red letter edition where in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts chapter 1, uh, Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3, and some other places, there are red letters. Unfortunately, I am rather colorblind, as my friends know. Uh, it looks soft pink. It doesn't look red to me. Uh, I can, it's hard for me to read, actually. But those are the words of Christ. I say that uh, to say that the red letters uh, were there so that we would easily notice the words of the Son of God. But for some reason, and I don't know why, we can make controversy out of something so simple and so innocent. There is so much controversy now about the red letters. 
Not that it's there as an aid, but by how you view them and how you look at them and how you understand them. Some believers are criticized for overemphasizing the importance of the words in the Bible that are colored red, meaning the words of Jesus, the red letters. And it just, as I uh, read uh, quite a bit about this uh, in the recent past, but, but of course last week as well, when I started reading what some people were saying about emphasizing the red words, the first thing that came to my mind is, How in the world can you overemphasize Jesus Christ? How can you overemphasize the words of the Son of God? We need more of that in everywhere, in everything, in all conversations, in everything that we study from Genesis to Revelation. The words of Jesus Christ need to come into every aspect of our life. So you can never overemphasize the the words of Jesus. Jesus himself said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. His words are eternal. And my friends, eternity goes both ways in time. He is the eternal word, not just the speaker of eternal words. He is both. So... That brings us, I have an interesting, to just a little bit more on on the red letters. Uh, I have a book in my library. It's about about the red letters and just a theology based on the red letters, the words that you find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's even groups that have kind of um, um, banded together. They call themselves the red letter Christians. Recently, blue, uh, blue letter Christians are coming around. I'm all confused. Uh, but simply, uh, the red letter Christians, the majority of them obviously love Jesus and love his words and want to give due diligence to the words of Jesus Christ. But what has happened with that type of focus is that they believe that if Jesus didn't say it, then I am not obligated to believe it. Meaning what Paul says, really, that theology is born out of anti-Paul belief. Why? Because Paul was designated by God, by, by God himself, by Jesus, called by Jesus himself to teach some of the hardest, most convicting things that have ever been taught or ever been written. And so the easiest thing that you can do to get away from what Paul teaches over very hard subjects that God wanted him to present to the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians, to all people in the world, was to say, well, if Jesus doesn't say it, I don't have to believe it. Now, there are some topics that Paul talks about, right, that are very challenging especially that talk about sexual immorality or homosexuality or male spiritual leadership. Well, if Paul teaches it, then I don't have to believe it because Jesus didn't say those words. My friends, I want you to understand something. There is... Well, let me read to you something that uh, that Paul wrote. Let it come up on the screen. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Paul had to defend himself in his words. He had to defend his calling all the time. There was a group of Christians, the church in Corinth, and so many of their leaders disregarded Paul because they say, well, he didn't walk with Christ or he's unimportant or he is not very impressive. uh, uh, His his teachings don't carry the same weight as, uh, as, as anybody else. And so by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Uh, Paul had to to defend himself and his gospel, as he said, my gospel. And so he said this, uh, these are the words of God through his pen. If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritually gifted, let him acknowledge that what I am writing to you is the Lord's command. If he ignores this, he himself will be ignored. Now, what does he mean by... Um, if uh, whoever ignores this, he himself will be ignored. By him? Nah, by God. By God himself, by Jesus himself. So Paul uh, is, is simply letting us know 
that his words are the red letters. His words are, quote, the words of Jesus Christ, his commands, his, his explanations, his, his uh, desires, and his teachings for the churches have to carry the same weight and have the same importance as the words of Jesus. So how do we take this? There is no way in the world, my friends, that you and I can overemphasize the words of Jesus because His words are life. They are so important. But on the other side of that, we can never deny Paul's teachings and still be faithful to Jesus. We cannot do that because they are the words of Jesus as well. Okay, so where does that tie into the lesson today uh, in the series that we are in? I want you to consider something very carefully. I want you to consider the words of Jesus as applied to you. I want you to think about Jesus speaking to you. Because do you realize that when you open your Bible, God is speaking to you? And if you have a Bible that is closed more often than it is open, then you are missing out on the messages and teachings that God wants you to have. God speaks to us through the pages of your Bible. His message is there for you. It's there for me. And we have to remember that. And so as we wonder, oh, like I said last week, I wonder what Jesus' voice sounds like. I may not understand the inflection. I may not get his accent or be able to understand the language that he used, a lot of Aramaic, a little bit of Hebrew, a little bit of Greek. I may not understand those languages as I hear them, but I can read the words and I can know the words of the Son of God. There are lessons to be learned, and what we should be consider, considering is this, that God's grace and God's truth come through Jesus Christ. Amen. They come through Jesus. Listen to what, uh, well, John chapter 1, verse 17. John, the writer now, John the, the apostle, not John the Baptist, even though this is in uh, the, the chapter 1 of John. John wrote... The law was given through Moses. Grace and truth come through Jesus Christ. Grace and truth come from Jesus Christ. What that means to you and I is that we need to consider His life, His words, His death, His burial, His resurrection, because these are the things that save our souls. And the words of Jesus that talk about all of this have to be important to us. One of the great blessings that, that, that we have, one of the great blessings, and that I, you know, as a, as a younger man, I was taught the Word of God uh, from some very serious, good, wonderful, loving teachers as I grew up. And one of the great blessings that I came to understand from their, their teaching me is that in our Christian heritage, now I'm talking about in heritage of churches of Christ, that this wonderful heritage of looking for the biblical pattern that we find in Scripture and following a pattern of teaching in Scripture, especially when it, comes to, when it comes to salvation, because words have meaning, and the collection of those words um, have meaning also. How often they are repeated is important. The, a string of words or a, 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 a series of teachings continually taught are important. It shows their importance. You know, the whole New Testament, the whole Bible, really, uh, uh, from the beginning to the end, has a discussion on, on what pattern means. But in the New Testament, we see three different kinds of patterns. Romans 12, 2, Paul talks about a pattern of worldly living. Don't follow that pattern. Don't be like everybody else. Don't live like the world. Don't act like the world. Don't follow um, who they are, the things that they, uh, that they do, follow the things they do, live the way they live. Paul wrote to the Philippian church in Philippians 3, verse 7. Paul talks about here a pattern of godly living. Live this way. Live this way. Follow the pattern that we give you. We lived as holy people in front of you. Now live in that holy way and you'll be blessed. Paul wrote to Timothy and said to Timothy to follow the pattern of sound teaching. 
There's a pattern of teaching. It's good words. It's sound words. It's of God. Follow these things because the pattern of the world is, is, is not the, the way that you should teach or be. Don't teach what they teach. Don't follow what they teach. And so the biblical pattern is clear about salvation. Receiving the grace of God begins when we hear and believe that message about Jesus Christ. We must hear it. We must hear it preached. We must hear it spoken. We must read it, the words, for ourselves. The word must be transmitted uh, to us. And hearing that, we must believe it. Now you can struggle with it, because if you, are, if you are honest with yourself, you'll struggle with these words for the rest of your life. There's value in that, by the way, of struggling with all those words. We must hear this word. We must believe the message of Jesus, that He is the Son of God, that He died for our sins, and not just hear it and believe it. We must believe it to the point where we are willing to turn our lives around change our lives, change the way we are living, walk away from things that are not of God to a way of life that is of God. That's the word repentance. The words of Jesus Christ will change your life when you hear them and when you fully believe them with all your heart. And you know, it's not, it's one thing to hear it and believe it and change your life. But my friends, it's not real until you speak it. You, do you, can you really say you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and I'm going to change my life because of the truth about Him? But you never talk about Him. You don't speak the name. You don't let that beautiful name fall off your tongue in, in the conversations that you have. It's not real unless you are willing to say that name and speak about Jesus with confidence and with conviction, you can see where I'm going, right? Hear and believe and repent and confess. And my friends, the, the, the ultimate expression of a life that's turned around, of full belief, and after you hear and, and are made aware of your need and Jesus providing salvation, is when we are baptized, when we are immersed in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's called a pattern, folks. That's called a biblical pattern because we find it in the red letters. You know, so often, and I know this is true, that we, we, we forget where we first find this simple pattern of words. Where do we find this first, this, this simple pattern of soul-saving words? It didn't originate in Acts. It didn't begin with Peter. It didn't begin on Pentecost. It wasn't on the road uh, to uh, on that that, that road and, and Gaza with with the with the Ethiopian eunuch and 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 Philip. That's not where this started. It started with the Son of God and the words that came out of His mouth. As Charles said, where do you think Peter learned it? Where do you think Philip the evangelist learned these words and teaching people how to be saved? It's Jesus' teachings. So. What did the Savior teach about salvation? What did the Savior teach about salvation? Jesus, the Son of God, preached that we must hear and obey His teachings. We must hear them, and we must obey them. Jesus, in His, in his teaching, in His, in his ministry, and during His sermons... Jesus reminded people that they needed to open up their ears and open up their hearts so that they could hear and understand and live out the message that he was teaching, whatever the message, whatever the message was. And so Jesus was dealing with people that, have a, that had a track record, especially their forefathers, they, her, their forefathers, their, their grandparents, I mean, all the way back many generations in the Old Testament had hard hearts, they had closed ears and, and closed minds, and whatever Moses was teaching or whatever the prophets were teaching, they disregarded them, they didn't believe them, or they would, they would a little bit with their, you know, on the outside, but it never went where it needed to go on the inside. So Jesus said these words. Have you heard these words? 
These are the words of the Son of God. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Are you hearing that message? My friends, if hearing the words of Jesus Christ will make a difference in whether you go to heaven or hell, it seems to me that you will be a person that is so immersed in the red words, in the words of the Son of God, and know them and learn them and bring them in, inculcate them into your life, because they are that important. Jesus says, open your ears. If you have ears, open them up. Because what I've got to say is important. Do you believe that the words of Jesus are important? Jesus preached that we must hear and obey his words. Now sadly, Jesus' words often fell on those deaf ears, just like when the prophets preached uh, in their olden days. Fell on deaf ears. So Jesus then made it clear that there can be no salvation unless we hear and obey and build a life on the words that come out of his mouth. It's that important. So Jesus said words like these. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. The converse is true. If you hear the words and you build you put them into practice, you build your life on them, your house will stand firm, and whatever storm comes your way, you are going to be just fine. Your house is what? Your house is your life. Don't let it crash down around you. Live the words of Christ. Hear those words. Take it in and live by them. Build your life on them. And boy, I tell you, that is the, 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 the basics, the foundational teaching of salvation right there. We must hear and build our life on the words of Christ. Jesus taught that we must believe that He is the Son of God. Believe what He was teaching, that He showed Himself and taught that He is God's Son, that He is the Son of Man, that He is from the Father, sent from the Father. And oh, that was hard to convince people of. Uh, the majority of people that Jesus taught, the vast majority of Jews, especially the religious elite, did not believe in Jesus. They did not believe where He came from. They did not believe His words, therefore. They wanted Him to be ignored. They wanted Him to be pushed away. They wanted Him to be killed. Jesus then confronted those people who denied, uh, and who, denied who He was. Jesus said these words, Matthew 21, verse 31 and 32. I tell you the truth. The tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness. You did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. And so what he's saying here is, listen, you don't believe me? You're not even believing the one who came before me, John the Baptist. But the prostitutes are, and the tax collectors are. And you, basically, you, the teachers of Israel, don't believe and will not believe. Jesus taught that we must believe that he is the Son of God. There is no salvation outside of that full, complete belief that Jesus is who He said He was and who He proved Himself to be through His miracles, especially of His resurrection. Not believing in Jesus is more than just a shame. Aw, bless their hearts, they don't believe in Jesus. It's not, it's not a bless your heart thing. It is more than a shame when people do not believe in Jesus because not believing in Jesus is a soul killer. You will lose heaven. You will lose living with God forever if you do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Now these are the words of Jesus about Himself. John chapter 8 and verse 24, Jesus said, I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe I am the one I claim to be. You will indeed die in your sins. 
Now, this is where Jesus is not speaking in metaphor. He's not teaching a parable. He's not telling a nice little story that sounds really good at VBS. You're not going to hear that verse at VBS. But Jesus said what he needed to say. My friends, we must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And by believing in Jesus, then, then salvation is possible. Salvation is what we receive. Jesus said we must hear his teachings and believe them. And we must, we must uh, uh, then do something about it. Jesus demanded that we repent. Demanded repent. We have already studied that multiple times in the last few weeks. Jesus was trying to get people to see where they were spiritually. The rich young ruler, God bless him, right? He was a good commandment keeper. There's nothing that says he didn't love the God or love the law. Uh, he, as, uh, he grew up hearing those words and, and living out the law. What a beautiful thing that was. But Jesus knew there was something in the way of going to heaven. He loved his money more than eternal life. And so Jesus knew he had to change. He had to turn around from that. He had to back off from that. And even if he, he wasn't able to, you know, to make that instantaneous reversal of the way he's always been, you know the Lord would have worked with him, right? He would not change. He walked away. And so Jesus demands that we repent from our sins. Jesus called sinners to change during his ministry. He does the same thing today because sinners coming to Jesus for forgiveness must repent. They must turn from their life of sin. He didn't condemn the woman who was caught in the very act of adultery. He said, I don't condemn you, but change your life. Turn from your life of sin. Turn away from it. Who says that Jesus doesn't want us to change? I understand the concept that Jesus accepts us as we are, but he never accepts that uh, uh, for very long. That's enough to learn about him and follow him, but we must change. What changes us? The words of Jesus Christ. Listen to Jesus. In Luke chapter 13, verses 3, or verses 3 and 4, he says it twice, he says it for effect. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. How do I read the word perish? That's lose your soul. It means nothing else. Unless you repent, unless you let the Lord change you, unless you read and understand and believe those words to the point where I have got to change my life after what I've read, after what He's done, I've got to change. I've got to do this. We must believe it that much that we repent. Now, when is it real? Jesus said that we must openly confess our faith with Him. Belief in Jesus cannot be a secret, folks. I'm sorry. There's no such thing as flying under the radar in Christianity. That's, I'm sorry. Now, some people are more extroverted. I love you extroverts. If you are an introvert, that's okay. But we can never allow ourselves to be silent Christians. We are meant to confess Confess is an expression of what you believe and what you know to be true. And that's where we summon, our, our, summon our, our courage to say and talk about what we know is true, what we fully believe is true. We must openly confess our faith in Him. We are called to publicly acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God, that He is the Christ. We must outwardly acknowledge our belief and our faith, it must be spoken. Jesus put it very clearly. These are the red words, Matthew 10, 32-33. Everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. This is where I usually say, I didn't write this. I didn't say it originally. Those are the words of the Son of God who takes it so seriously. Why? Because our souls depend on it to hear and to believe and to obey and to, to turn our life around and to confess that holy name. He knows it's so important. He knows that's what we need. 
Jesus also commanded that we baptize, that we must be baptized to be saved. We absolutely must. That is not a common thought or a common belief in the majority of Christian believers, of Christ believers in this world anymore. And that is an absolute uh, 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 ignoring of the truth of what the Word says about this. Baptism or immersion, which is all the Word means, is the most resisted point in the biblical response to the gospel. But my friends, it was practiced, it was taught, and it was commanded by Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And to say that baptism is insignificant or unnecessary is to do what Jesus said as the words that, uh, that, uh, that Phil read to us a little while ago. To say that this is not important is to ignore the word of the Son of God. And my friends, we can never do that. Jesus told uh, a man at night, a, a good man, uh, by everything we knew of him, he said, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and spirit. My friends, we can and we must believe Jesus in this point. Jesus, in the last words that he said to his disciples before he let, before he left this world, made it very clear um, what he wanted those who believed in him to be about and what they needed to submit to. Now you understand, don't you, that if you are not going to see someone ever again uh, until heaven, that the last opportunity, the last words you say to them, don't you think that those would be the most important things, not the minutia of life? Did I use that word minutia right? I think so, I hope so. Don't you think that the last words of the Son of God will be the most important things that must be said so that they can be believed and taught and the word spread. Jesus said these words before he went back to the Father. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Go into all the world, he, Mark writes, and preach the gospel, the good news, to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. This pattern of teaching that Jesus began, that he taught at first, was heard and faithfully taught and practiced by his apostles when Jesus went away and after the Holy Spirit came. And so, don't you think that these words, these red words about the most important thing in life, salvation, should always be on the tip of our tongue, should be in our heart, should be in our mind, should be something that we, that we hear constantly and believe, and biblically and, 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 and rightly uh, observed and followed in our life. This is what we need to talk. Uh, teach. So my friends, my plea to you right now is to view yourself in the words that Jesus spoke to you today. Have you heard, do you know what Jesus taught about being saved? Do you believe it? Do you believe it to the point where you will obey it? That you will turn your life around, that you will openly confess His holy name and then submit to baptism by immersion to have your sins washed away. Will you do that? I think at the very least, um, if that is true about you, that these are the beautiful, life-saving words that we need to be speaking to people and teaching and preaching and sharing with people that we know and love. The words of Jesus. The stuff from Acts on is just as important. But, oh, but show them the words of the Son of God and do those first because that's where they originate. That's where they come from. That's why it's so important. If we can help you in any way, if you want to respond in any way, if today's the day you're immersed, if today's the day you want to give your life to Christ, maybe you've walked away and you need to come back and we need to pray for you. We want to do that because that is so important. But if we can help you in any way, please come while we sing this next song.